factory in the Granite State. Today's program, um, we will be looking at um, some little known stories um, of our history here, and we look forward to a great dialogue. Before, Dan, can you change the screen, please? Before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge that we are um, we're here on traditional lands and waterways of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples, past and present. We acknowledge with honor and gratitude the land itself and the people who have stored it throughout the generations. Our program, the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, um, that you're seeing for those of you who know the work that we do, we promote awareness and appreciation of African-American history and life in order to build more inclusive communities today. We do, do this through educational programs such as the tea talks that you'll see today, um, the Eleanor William Hooker tea talk series. Um, the series is really our series is really about um, uh, communities coming together to dialogue. Um, this series, particular this year, claiming our place, blacks in white spaces, will really look at um, different genres, places where we don't really expect African Americans, Blacks to be. And we call these white spaces, places where Blacks and people of color are marginalized, typically absent and unexpected. So we're asking you today to really just join in the conversation. Uh, I will have Gina come on to give us some technical points on how you can do that. And um, Gina, I'll pass it on over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we ask that throughout the presentations, if you could please keep your mics muted, um, that would be appreciated. At the end of the program, we will have a question and answer period. Um, during that time, if you want to use the little raise the hand function, um, you can do that and the moderator will call on you and you can unmute your mic and ask your question. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can put them in the chat and we will try to um, try to get to your questions. If you have any problems with your um, technical, with your computer, any technical problems, um, please preface your question with the letters IT so our IT team knows that you're having IT problems. Um, a, the closed captioning should be working. If you go to the bottom of your screen and find the live transcript um, button and uh, choose uh, um, auto transcription, you should get the closed captioning if you need that. Um, and we have just a couple of um, notes for our community dialogue group agreement. I will read through those real quick. We ask that everyone please be respectful. Please listen and share the airtime. Focus on the idea, not the person. Please um, be present, be crisp, and say what is to the core of the discussion. Please be open-minded and honor confidentiality within the group. It's okay to put issues like race and class on the table, but Please feel free to take risks, be raggedy, make some mistakes, and then let it go. And now I will send it back to, I forgot who I'm sending it back to, David, um, or Jerry Ann. And thank you, Gina. So it's my honor to introduce now our moderator for today's um, panel discussion. And Senator David Waters has represented the fourth, the fourth district in New Hampshire Senate since 2012. Prior to his election to the Senate, he served two terms in the New Hampshire House of Representatives. He has worked as a professor of English, teaching American literature, New England studies, and New Hampshire literature and culture at the University of New Hampshire. He is also a member of the board for the Black Heritage Trail, and we're really honored to have him with us. David? Well, thank you so much, uh, Jerry Ann, and 
Welcome everyone to Claiming Our Place, Blacks in White Spaces. Now, New Hampshire has long been known for its professed whiteness. Um, Lorraine Carey called her New Hampshire autobiography Black Ice for her encounter with the frozen white North. And Danzy Senna's wonderful novel, Passing for White in New Hampshire, she dubbed the state Caucasia. These are the experiences of a shadow experience in New Hampshire. And much of New Hampshire's history has been, as the path-breaking issue of historical New Hampshire was titled, too long in the shadows. And as Harriet Wilson knew, the shadows fall north, this becoming the title of the Vaulter's great film with Jerry Ann and Valerie Cunningham on recovering New Hampshire's black history. Well, as they say, the shadow knows. And the shadow knows about New Hampshire's white spaces and the prodigious efforts for the past two centuries to erase Black history from the state's historical record. Efforts resisted by African Americans engaged in the work of what Toni Morrison called rememory. You know, Frederick Douglass made a telling remark in 1892. He was very ill, one of his last public speeches at the dedication of the John Parker Hale Monument on the State House Plaza. He said that he felt he had been invited, invited to add a little color to the occasion. Not that Douglas was an invisible man, but he saw the ironies of being one drop of black in the optic white history of New Hampshire. And so when Martin Luther King proclaimed in Washington, so let freedom ring for the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire, it, it wasn't really a compliment to the Granite State as he then paired its hilltops with Stone Mountain in Georgia as twin peaks of segregation, as we will hear today about the civil rights struggle in New Hampshire. Now, people talk about the civil rights era as if it was something that began and ended. No mission accomplished banner, certainly. And with New Hampshire's revolutionary and early national struggles we're gonna hear about through our history, and then up to not passing MLK Day until 1999, and then the continuing equality to get this work done today, witness the Black Lives Matter chapter in New Hampshire. So perhaps the civil rights era really began in 1619 and the completion date is in the shadows of some future time. That's why the work of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire is so important and why today's focus on New Hampshire reminds us of the work that must be done in the deep shadows of the past and also in the past of the last few decades that is fleeting away, if not emulsified into current history. Some days, the story of our times will be history. And consider, for example, the young leaders being celebrated this evening at six o'clock by Black Lives Matter Seacoast chapter. Zoom in and see the mark being made on our future today. Well, it's a great pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Uh, we have first Sharon Jones, uh, just a legendary performer, a native of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And Sharon shines as an original standout of the Seacoast music scene and beyond with engagement throughout New England in Boston and New York. And she's gonna share her experiences with us. Then we're gonna have Renee Allen, uh, she's an author and artist who lives in New Exeter, New Hampshire, an artivist, as she says. Renee likes to apply art to social issues in the form of painting, literature, graphic design, and sometimes fabric. Her most recent books include a trilogy of historical fiction mysteries set in Exeter, New Hampshire, Incident at Exeter Tavern, Incident at Ioka, and Incident at Exeter Depot. And she will inform us today about the history of extraordinary members of the Black community in Exeter. Barbara Baker Williams was first born in New Orleans, was born in New Orleans, Louisiana. She participated in the civil rights movement from 18, 1958 to 1962 and was instrumental in integrating the city. 1962, at age 19, because of her affiliation with the civil rights movement, 
she was taken by two white supremacists and placed on a freedom train from New Orleans to Nashua, New Hampshire. Now she's had a family uh, issue and is on her way to uh, Atlanta, but she recorded her conversation and uh, with the uh, help of um, the, the trail, we're gonna be able to see that uh, as well. So as Sam Cooke sang, let's bring it on home, Sharon. Okay, I'm here, I think. Nope, I'm not. Does that one need to be unclipped too, that video? Oh, yeah. I'm here, how are you? Hi. Hi. Hi, Hi how are you? You're all set, Sharon. Go right okay. ahead. Uh, well, how would you like me to start? By just um, telling you who I am, which you've already done. My, I, I wanted to, during the civil rights movement, I hadn't been out of high school that long during, during that time. But I will um, talk to you about an incident that happened with my sister Jane and her husband, Emerson, at the... Uh, Wentworth by the Sea during the year of 1964 on July the 4th. My sister along with, I, I got some notes here. My, my sister along with a professor from the University of New Hampshire, his name was Hugh Potter. Hugh Potter and his wife, Jean Potter, uh, along with my sister Jane and her husband, went to the, uh, the Wentworth by the Sea for, for dinner. And when they arrived, uh, James Barker Smith was told that there were a white couple and a biracial, uh, a biracial uh, couple, uh, foursome, Jean Potter and her husband Hugh, and my sister Jane and her husband Emerson. Uh, they went to the when up by the sea, um, they, it wasn't actually, it was a sting operation, which no one knew about who, were, who was in the, um, the hotel at the time. My sister Jane and her husband entered the lobby of the hotel along with Jean Potter and her husband and waited uh, to be seated. Someone alarmed uh, James Barker, who, who Smith, who was the owner of the Wentworth by the Sea, that uh, there were uh, a couple in the lobby waiting to be seated who were also with a white couple. James Barker went to the area immediately, uh, very uh, alarmed and frustrated, and told them that blacks were not allowed in the Wentworth by the Sea, and that was 1964, I want to repeat, because that's, that's not that long ago. They uh, had a conversation with James Barker Smith that lasted quite some time. Finally, James Barker uh, said, we uh, are not going to allow this black couple to come into my restaurant, especially on the 4th of July when my um, dining room is full of Caucasian people who have traveled from various parts of the country to his hotel, which they normally did. And no blacks were allowed and had not been up until that point. My uh, sister was asked to stand in the lobby. She waited for, uh, I understand she waited for two hours while James Barker and Mr. Potter went into his office and had a conversation uh, about why they, they could not allow this black couple into the hotel. Uh, I understand that the, the sting operation was, was, was set up by the NAACP and um, Mr. Potter uh, produced the legal documents that he had with him, at which point 
after two hours, James Barker seated them in the main dining room. What's, what's notable to me is um, my sister Jane, uh, after the experience, which she felt was horrible and she was had a lot of dignity, which we all did and do. Uh, it affected Jane, I think, for, for most of the rest of her life that, you know, knowing that you're discriminated against and actually experiencing it face to face, one on one, I think it's a whole different experience. And that's what my sister and her husband went through um, on that day. My sister Jane, when she returned home, I remember her walking, we all waited at her house because we wanted to, we wanted to know what the outcome was. And, you know, my mother and father were the parents of 10 girls and three boys. And Jane was the third born and had experienced a lot of discrimination. My parents, I wanted to back up for a minute because my mother and father uh, came to New, New Hampshire, came to Portsmouth, New Hampshire in 1938 with uh, their children. Only two of the children were born here in Portsmouth. I was one of them, my sister Karen being the other. Well, to go back a, a little bit now and uh, just to talk about how that experience of, uh, uh, affected my sister Jane. Uh, she told us the whole story. And I remember her sitting down. She was stunning, stunning uh, lady, well-dressed as her husband, the four of them, Mr. Potter and his wife and Jane and Emerson went to the hotel that they knew they were going to be turned down. But yet and still, the actual um, denial of being able to walk into that dining room was, was uh, uh, terribly affected my sister Jane. When you have a dignity that you grow up with and that's been instilled in you, you walk into a place where you're all of the sudden uh, told that you're different than we are, you're not allowed here. Uh, you sort of expected that to happen in the South, but you didn't really expect it to happen in the North. And when you were hit with it to that degree, it had a profound effect on your life, I think, for the rest of her life. Well, as it turned out, um, they were allowed into the dining room. And what is stunning is my sister Jane said, uh, she said, you know, when they finally agreed to let us walk into the main dining room and have dinner, she said, nobody turned around. So it was clearly uh, a problem of the immediate group who was there, the, the hotel and its ownership. They had the problem. A lot of the residents and people who were having dinner there were from various different parts of the world. And it seemed that they had already experienced being in the company of Blacks without a, a, a problem sitting in the same room. But from that point on, on that day in 1964, at the Wentworth by the Sea, it had become integrated. And my sister Jane and her husband, I think, played a major, major role in that. Now, there are other incidents that happened to me and my family, my sisters and my brothers in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. I've never regretted that my mother and father chose to move their family to New Hampshire. They were in Seneca Falls, New York. That's where they were raised. 
My father was from um, um, Auburn, New York, and my mother was from Seneca Falls, New York. I hope I got that right. My sister will call me later and let me know. But uh, um, so they came, already came from uh, an all white area and they were used to being uh, singled out as, as black people. But I, I, I think back during that time a lot, especially now that we are having so many problems that seem to have taken us back to that era with uh, the former president now gone and our new president and the things that we got to try to put in place to make sure that we don't go backwards. I'm um, proud that, that to, to be a, a part of this family, my family, the Joneses and all that they experienced. Uh, I could, there's a lot, many, many more stories, but I can't tell them all today. But I certainly do appreciate you uh, having me on to tell this one, thank you. Well, thank you, Sharon. And, um, you know, I was a dear friend of Hugh Potter and uh, that story has resonated for so many decades because it's so important about the segregation that was here. And I bet Sharon that we're gonna have some questions later on about, um, you know, what things were life in the sixties when Portsmouth was uh, part of Jim Crow North. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll have some questions and thank you. And uh, now I'll invite uh, Renee to take the screen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everybody. And thank you to the Black Heritage Trail for inviting me tonight. And thank you, Sharon, for sharing your story of your family. My name is Renee. I'm an Exeter citizen. And as mentioned, I'm also an artivist. I like to apply art to various forms of activism. So for this project, I wrote a, a historical fiction trilogy that highlights the hidden history of about 100 years of a free Black community in Exeter, just after the Revolutionary War. Prior to the war, there were a few Blacks, but not so many. But directly after the war, scholarly research shows that Exeter had the highest percentage of Blacks in the entire state of New Hampshire, and this was 4.6%. We don't really know why, but at that time, there were about 86 Blacks and 220 Whites. So you see, in addition to the Blacks that were already living here before the war, about 10 black soldiers settled, they married, they had children, and they also had grandchildren. It was this way for about 100 years, but then that community was all but erased. Exeter's black history has been hiding in plain sight now for over 150 years. These official history books of Exeter barely make mention of this community. So today, I'd like to share with you a quick PowerPoint on the most famous of those Revolutionary War veterans, Jude Hall. So this is gonna be Jude Hall, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I'm gonna to do a share screen. There we go. There it is. Hmm. Okay. So Jude's family story is quite compelling and it draws us into the wider black community of about maybe 125 people over that 100 years. We don't know why these veterans came and settled to Exeter. Perhaps they were following Jude or their officers or maybe because the treasury was there. Exeter was the revolutionary capital of the state of New Hampshire back then. Okay, and so here's a, Here's a rendering of Jude in front of the Folsom Tavern. Jude was physically described as a large and very strong man. He had nicknames of Old Rock and Captain. This is not Jude here, but this is his signature. Jude was born here and enslaved on the Blake Farm in Kensington off of Drinkwater Road. At about 18 years old, he was sold and he ran away to join the Continental Army. This was before war was actually declared. He fought at Bunker Hill, and then he went on for another eight years. He came back to Exeter and married Rhoda Paul, daughter of Caesar Paul, most likely from Africa, and of Lovey Rollins, who was the daughter of a white lawyer from Stratum. They lived in a house on Drinkwater Road and had a large family. And I wonder why he chose to go back 
quite close to Kensington, I wonder if his family was still at Blake's farm in Kensington. So traces of Jude do remain today. A memorial stone was erected in 2000 when his real grave could not be located in the Winter Street Cemetery. A descendant of Farmer Blake, Mr. Ed Wall, erected this stone. It's quite large. And also here is a sign that's located at approximately 70 Drinkwater Road, indicating a walking trail. You can still see the pond right there, but no dwellings remain. And this is the site of the tragedy. Jude had an 18-year-old son named James, who signed on to go work aboard a ship, but he changed his mind. Actually, he was not quite 18. One day while Jude was away, an agent of the ship came and actually ended up kidnapping him. This man was an Exeter, Exeter resident named Wentworth. Rhoda, James' mom, and one of her daughters tried to fight off Wentworth, but he got the boy, he tied him up. They headed to Newburyport where James sailed the very next day on Captain Isaac Stone of Newburyport's ship called the Wallace, and they went to Alexandria, Virginia. James was taken off the ship and sold never to be seen again by his family. When Jude got home, he was frantic. He spoke with lawyers, judges, to no avail. He tried to find Captain Stone of Newburyport, but somehow could never find him at home. Jude died never knowing what became of his son, and that mystery remains to this day. This violent event was not reported in the Exeter newspapers. There is no mention in town documents. The two sources of this are an affidavit that Rhoda wrote in William Garrison's Liberator nearly 20 years later. And this gives some clues as what to happen to the boy. There's also an affidavit from her son-in-law. If you want to see these sources for yourself, you can go to Jude Hall's new Wikipedia page and look at the footnotes at the bottom. So here's what we're thinking about for Jude for tomorrow. In light of this hurtful story, I wanted to perform a small act of redress for Jude and Rhoda Hall. I decided to donate all the profits from my self-published trilogy to a physical commemoration of this historic black community. And the biggest project is a proposal for a small black heritage pocket park downtown. Here you can see a sketch here. This is directly across from the American Independence Museum, which hosts the big festival each summer. So this past summer, I asked the Exeter Select Board for their blessing to form a committee of representatives from local entities like the Exeter Historical Society, the Racial Unity Team, the Planning Board. And this sketch is one possibility that the committee has come up with. The committee has also determined that the proposed park should have signage that points people to an official website full of information about these historic community members. There are many interesting stories. Recently, a public panel was hosted on this park idea. This was on February 19th, and you can see this if you want to check out the whole story. This is on the YouTube channel of Exeter TV, also on Exeter TV's Facebook page. So here's some more info where you can look to see some resources at the Jude Hall Wikipedia page davidtdixon.com. David is a scholar that came in from out of state. Uh, he wanted to find out, he wanted to discuss the community in New Hampshire that had the largest percentage of Blacks, and he determined Exeter was the one. Exeter Historical Society has a bunch of information on Jude Hall, including some of their history minutes. And at the at this page on my website, the Park Project page at the very bottom, there's a list of some resources that I personally use to write these three books. Also, you know, I wanted to disseminate the contributions of some of these people to a global audience. So I did make an, a Wikipedia page for Jude Hall, as well as John Garrison Cutler, who I profile in my third book. And I beefed up a small page on a poet. Exeter has an abolitionist poet named James Monroe Whitfield. And as a side note, I see that the poet Whitfield is included in a brand new anthology book entitled African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song. And finally, in hopes of reaching a totally different audience than history buffs, I penned this fun trilogy of historical fiction mysteries pictured here. They feature some of the black people that I just mentioned. However, because I did not want to appropriate 
the voices of the black characters, I also dug around and I featured some strong white women of Exeter's past whose stories have also been hidden in plain sight. So thank you for listening to my presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you so much uh, uh, for, for that, Renee. And, um, you know, I bet lots of folks are looking forward to reading these books and learning more about um, about Jude Hall. And I think what's also so important about what you're doing is trying to communicate this history in a way that can engage audiences today and then find a physical place in Exeter so that, you know, that strategy of having a, a place that cannot be ignored in a way, and it is a, a kind of a, 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 an opportunity and a catalyst for the kinds of conversations about this history. And I think also what's so important about your um, research too is that you know when people who study African American history think of the of Exeter, of course they think of Whitfield, um, but it, the Paul family um, now they kind of decamped down to Boston and um, pastored at the African Meeting House, became stalwarts of the abolitionist community in Boston, and Sarah Paul um, wrote the first auto, the first biography of an African American, um, the story of a of a young boy who died piously, but it's, it is the first uh, biography in African-American. So this, people follow the story there and, and they don't, don't realize what an extraordinary community uh, was in Exeter for, as you say, this, this century of time. So um, it's hoped that the Black Heritage yeah. Trail will be, um, a, a, you know, is, is kind of ready to go on having a, a trail in Exeter and your, your research and history. I'm sure we're gonna have some more questions about this uh, great story uh, as, as well. So. With that, um, now I'm gonna, I guess, Dan Conley through his his uh, his magic here is gonna be bringing us the conversation um, with Barbara. So if you could. Okay, I'll watch the time. <laughs> okay, uh, it, it started, my husband was part of the civil rights movement. So was I, we integrated New Orleans. Uh, my husband was kind of like a militant, so he was kind of target. And so um, one time the police came to the house and uh, they, well, we thought it was the police, but it was really a white supremacist. And I was pregnant with, um, at that time, um, oh, my fourth child and they pulled him out of the house and they took him to jail. And then when he came out of jail, he had on, a cardboard that says nigger stay in your place and he had to take the bus and when he came home well while uh they were grabbing him there were a, a gas line next to our house where i climbed on a gas line because they were going to take both of us he was part of the reverse of uh, traveling on the bus he was traveling on the bus with a, a few others and he ended up in um manchester uh, at the, uh, um, I guess the army base. Okay, so then they came after me to get me out. I was still pregnant in like closer to seven months. And uh, they said, I only have like 30 minutes to get all my things, meaning three babies and, and, and get out. Uh, they came back. And when they came back, uh, I was only able to collect about uh, two, uh, changing the clothes for three kids and a, a whole bunch of baby food, jars of baby food, and put it in um, a handbag. I didn't have a chance to grab a, a suitcase or anything, no suitcase. And uh, then they took me to the train station, of which I was met by supremacists. It was a gang of them, but two of them hopped the train with me and uh, they carried the tickets. They were holding on the, to the tickets and it was like about five or six transfers. I can't remember how many, but uh, each time we, we got to a certain city state, uh, then two more would get on. And so when we got to New York uh, and spending the night there and kids roaming all over, getting, getting themselves dirty, I was, uh, I was allowed to go to the bathroom only with someone standing at the door because there's only one way in and one way out. And so when I went to the bathroom, I was afraid that they would do something with my kids. So me, all the kids went into the bathroom together. 
So when the morning came and it was time for us, uh, first of all, when we were in New York and they were getting ready to relieve the two that was uh, corralling me, another two came in and they said that we'll take care of her. And uh, I guess they were kind of a, a belligerent attitude. And so the two that were already sitting with me overnight said, that's okay, we'll uh, get her to Boston. So when we got to Boston, it, we had to cross from one location of Boston to another location. And um, they put me on the last train coming to New Hampshire, a commuter's train where all the uh, laborers from uh, New Hampshire would go to Massachusetts to work. When I was sitting um, in the train station with all the uh, commuters, they all had left but one gentleman. And uh, at this time they had, I think, one little bench there and me with my little bag of stuff and my kids. And he asked me if I was in labor and I lied and said, yes, I was because um, I wasn't sure what else to do. But then he says, well, I'll take you where you need to go. So I had this one little piece of paper, brown piece of paper with the address that says 8 Pine Street. So I, uh, he took me, I, I was kind of reluctant to get in his car. So me, my kids, my three kids, myself, we got into the front seat and at Pine, on Pine Street, the curbs came really high. So when he opened the door, we all fell out. <laughs> uh, so he was telling me that this is where you live, where the plastic curtain was blowing out of the window was my destination. And now I'm gonna go. Um, I'm, 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 I'm going to go to So when after that, after this episode, I went to work for St. Joseph Hospital as a switchboard operator. Uh, meeting Dr. Chris and Dr. Fairfield and all of the people who were all standing by me throughout this whole situation. But uh, one, moving uh, fast forward, one year later, uh, Sister Gendra had uh, my children. Uh, she decided, she says, uh, what you're going to do, what you need to do is uh, we have godparents for your children. And they all going to have to turn Catholic because they were from Quebec and Montreal, Canada. And we're going to move you up on the French Hill. So November 22nd, you know that, that date, November 22nd, 1963, one year later, when Kennedy was shot, I thought everybody was crying and happy for me that I had bought my house on the hill. But they were crying for Kennedy, who had just been shot. But... It was one year later, I saved up enough money for that house. And then when they were gonna go to the school, uh, the nuns asked uh, who was gonna teach my kids French. And all the godparents that Sister Gendrum had selected said they would. And that's how I ended up on the French Hill. Removing myself from that area where they had the geographical area for all the people who they thought should remain there because there were a lot of prejudice going on in Nashua. And when I spoke to um, one of the ladies, she said, we are all afraid of African-Americans because all we ever heard was negative uh, news me on the news media, everything was negative. And so um, at the Unitarian Universalist Church, I request uh, the pastors, the rabbis, the, we all got together, their parishioners at the Unitarian Universalist Church, a little white church, I forgot the name of the street, I think it was White Street, I'm, I'm not sure exactly uh, the name of the street. They brought all of these people into their church, their, their, uh, the church area, and uh, it was uh, a potluck. So that meant we had to get all the African-Americans from over there, and bring them over to the Unitarian so that the name of the theme was getting to know, know, getting to know your neighbors. And that still might be in a Nashua Telegraph on how that all came together so that uh, Caucasians and, and they can get to understand what Blacks were all about. 
So after that point, we were working on trying to get them better housing, better locations. And so it was seemed like leaving New Orleans, my job was just starting to integrate Nashua because there really was not a lot of integration there. And I'd left New Orleans, part of the civil rights movement. They had already integrated New Orleans to come back, to go to a place that was worse, worse than New Orleans, because the people didn't know how, uh, what to feel about African-Americans. And so they started up the NAACP in Manchester and um, the rest is, uh, Oh, I met, I met Pauline. We had a fire uh, on um, Vine Street. I moved from Pine to Vine out of the neighborhood, which is about two streets down. And it was a fire started. So going to Pauline's house where she had uh, almost as many kids as I have. And she had one son there. Uh, my, I had one, one son that was darker. And because my husband was kind of light skinned and I'm dark and one son that was darker and uh, uh, the two, the, the three other children, brown skin. And so the little boy said to his mom, which is Pauline, which is Jerry's mother-in-law, says, uh, well, what happened in the fire? Did he burned up because he was darker? And Pauline had to come up with an answer for that. So did I. And she says, no, but he wanted to know, and he, she says, feel his skin. And he says, it doesn't feel burned. And she says, nope, they're African-Americans, uh, African at that time, Negroes with different complexions, different skin colors. That doesn't mean that they're different people. And he says, okay, like he really didn't get it, but he was trying his best, but they all play together. And I really think that because of, Pauline and my connection, and we got along so great um, that um, her children and my children, uh, what's his name, the, the one that married Jerry, uh, got his name, but in any case, I think that the idea of marrying a Black woman was uh, part of getting to know who Blacks were. So. They can't even relate, but the thing is, if it wasn't for, uh, what if it wasn't for slavery? What if there was no slavery? And all the different nations of people got together and like a big community. Mm -hmm. Would we be exed out and say, hey, we don't belong or they're not equal or we just because we don't understand where they came from Africa, that they're, we cannot embrace them and they can't be in a pole. And, and uh, how do you get white people or anybody who has prejudice against African-Americans to open up their minds to just someone being a human being and we all are created equal? Yeah. How do you get them to undo their thinking and make them aware that if God created us equal, equally, how are you the one to say that he shouldn't have, or he didn't, or whatever makes you feel good and makes you feel like you're more superior than someone else? What have you done to make yourself feel more superior than someone else versus Indian, uh, Chinese, uh, you know, any Asian person or anyone? What, make, what gave you the right to think that you're more superior than that person? What, what has to happen to put everybody on the same plateau in your mind? Is that one of the questions that I'm going to be asked? <laughs> I don't know. You, you asked the question yourself. That's great. Um, I, you know. <sighs> well, okay. Now, remember now, my godchildren, my children's godparents, were all Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And so what they did, they went all out of their way to make my children feel comfortable mm -hmm. with them. And I mean, they were in their lives. When they said that they were gonna stand up for them, they meant it, you know? So when they got to know us 
it was like a family. You know, we mm -hmm. would go someplace with them, they would go someplace with us, and they didn't have to be re-indoctrinated over anything because now they feel that, hey, especially if you're reading the Bible, that God created us all equal. How could you say you're a Christian and you're treating someone else like they don't count? Well, thank you so much, Dan, uh, for bringing Barbara to us by that wonderfully filmed interview. And I'm sure we'll want to take an opportunity to have conversation with, with her when, uh, when she is able. Um, but we do have with us today Pauline Bogus, who um, knows Barbara's story well. And I thought maybe um, if she was willing, she could add a, a few minutes to tell us a little bit more about Barbara's uh, story. So if we can have Pauline uh, join us, that would be just a, a, a nice, nice treat. Am I unmuted? Yes, you Am are. I, okay. Well, uh, <laughs> we had four children at the time, I think, when Barbara moved with, into in with us. And that was a, quite an exciting time. It was an unusual thing to have happen. Uh, we, the, the way they came to us was through, we were involved in a, in, a, in a social action movement with a priest by the name of Father Thomas Keenan. And he was the one that knew, that knew Barbara's husband, Pierce. And when their apartment got burnt down, he asked if they could come and stay with us until they found him another apartment. So they moved in with us with their four children. And I remember when it, one of the first few days that it happened, one of the, her girls got sick. So we called our doctor to come. And of course, in those days, the doctors came to the house. And so our doctor comes to the house and he takes care of the little girl. And then he follows me into the kitchen and says, well, where did they come from? It was, you know, I mean, there were so few blacks in New Hampshire at that time that it was, you know, a remarkable thing. But they were such a wonderful family and our kids got along so well and, and we just enjoyed knowing them for the whole time that they were here and it was just a wonderful, marvelous experience and um, we were fortunate that we had the opportunity to uh, have our children get to know them and and uh, and be friends with them and uh, Barbara was a wonderful person and we've kept in touch through the years and she's still a remarkable person has been her whole life yeah well so, thank, you. thank you so much Pauline and it may be during the question period if somebody wants to talk a little bit more about um, you know what things were like uh, in in New Hampshire um, back in those days you might be able to um, answer some of those. Sure. Um, I wondered before we turn to the uh, questions, and if you have questions, please put them in the, please put, uh, submit them and we'll, we'll get to them. Um, but Sharon, if you could come back on, I did want to ask you a, a little conversation, uh, if we could. Okay, I think I'm here. Well, thank you, Sharon. And, um, you know, we've heard about the 1960s now from Barbara's experience, and uh, we have the experience, you know, perhaps the most notable uh, segregated institution was Wentworth by the Sea, but of course the Rockingham Hotel and a lot of other places, um, even, you know, federal housing built with federal dollars uh, had restrictive covenants uh, in Portsmouth, not just for Blacks, but also for Jews and Greeks, you know, that, those were the days. Um, but I wondered what your kind of experience was in the 1950s about, you know, did you feel there were stores that you wouldn't be welcome into or restaurants or, you know, what, what was the situation like in the beauty parlors and the barber shops? I mean, just some of the sense of what life was like in, you know, downtown Portsmouth. Did you, what kind of feelings you had about, you know, what, what, what things might not be open to you? Well, um, beauty parlors and Food parlors, barber shops, restaurant, all of the businesses that you would normally go to for whatever it was that you needed at the time were not as available to blacks in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And I've always and I went to school, graduated from uh, Portsmouth High School. So Valerie Cunningham and I were were really close. And uh just to experience um, the separation of the different powers that were 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 there, uh, you you felt it 
when you walked into a restaurant and you didn't go to the beauty parlors or the or the barber shops because it was already uh, known that you weren't going to be welcome there. Um, I had some problems in high school as well. It, it, trying to explain what it felt like is difficult because it was so embedded in our souls, if you will, and in our hearts and just to be separated from another race that seemed to be comfortable letting you know that you were not like they were. You were not accepted as they were. As uh, Barbara mentioned, what was it that uh, th that they promoted themselves, if you will, as a kind of people that were um, allowed to do things that we couldn't do. Like even the beaches, there were beaches that you were not allowed on. Um, I remember my school graduation, uh, an event at the Wentworth by the Sea was part of the uh, process, if you will. Of, there were different events that went on during the graduation. And one of them took place at the Wentworth by the Sea. And then again, I remember my date and I went to, um, we went to Hampton to the casino because the rest of the party that graduated from Port High School went to the Wentworth by the Sea and we were not allowed to go there. That was 1962. And as I mentioned, um, this integration took place in 1964 with the Potters and my sister Jane and her husband Emerson Reed. So in 1962, the weather by the sea was off limits. Um, you know, it has a, a profound effect, I think, on us people of color for all of our lives. There are times when I have spoken to colleagues or kids that I went to school with and said, well, Sharon, we never felt any difference. You know, we didn't know that there really wasn't any problem when we were in school. And I always say, you know, how can you be so far removed from these feelings that you didn't know that they were affecting me even though they weren't affecting you. Why, why was it that you weren't privy to that? Why didn't you recognize that? If I was your friend, and you were my friend, and you were going through something because of my compassion and my need to understand and my need to, uh, to be a part of what you're going through. I would step out of the box long enough to see what I could do about it. But it didn't, it didn't happen um, that way. And one of the things that troubles me a lot right now is what's happening right now along the same lines, you know, with the gerrymandering and the voting suppressions and, and all this going on. It bothers me as to, how far back are we going to go if these things are not straightened out? So um, I think I spend a, a lot more time thinking about these things than I, than I ever thought I would be doing at this point in my life because I thought a lot of that was taken care of. It just seems like it's never taken care of. It always bounces back. But I do believe uh, I have a lot of faith in the young generations, the white and the black. I think these young people have a strategy. They have a different mindset. And I think they're going to pull us over the line. <laughs> well, I, I really appreciate your optimism there. Uh, and I, I hope it is warranted. I will just mention that, um, you know, I'm put my state senator hat on. We have a 
a bill coming to the Senate floor this week that I think is a pretty comprehensive voter suppression bill. And, um, you know, this, the shadows are still falling here. And, you know, it's just wonderful to hear these stories and people to remember just what it was like for people to stand up, you know, as, as you and your sister and your family and the Potters. And of course there was Dudley Dudley and uh, Betty and oh, yes. Barney, yes. Betty and Barney Hill. Right. Yes. And, uh, you know, and then there were some new people, you know, coming, finding housing uh, from Pease, African-Americans trying finding some housing in Portsmouth. And so there was a, there certainly was a, something there. And, you know, mentioning young people and their aspirations, I, I just did want to ask as well, because I've heard from Valerie Cunningham a little bit about what it was to be graduating and then what were the, what were the job prospects? Um, you know, especially, you know, some folks that couldn't get it, maybe couldn't get a teaching job or a job as a bookkeeper or um, if they had professional training, uh, they might have to go south or, or elsewhere. And so how, how did you feel when you're graduating about, you know, what, what, did you, what were your aspirations and, and what you, what'd you feel? Well, I, I was, um, uh, had myself pointed into the musical field yeah. right from the onset. So I knew that my, um, uh, my transfer wasn't going to be as difficult as some others. I wasn't trying to become a secretary or a uh, a person in the medical profession or any any of that sort of thing. But of course, my father's experience is a whole nother story, and and I have sisters that that had other stories. But when I graduated from high school, I didn't stay in New Hampshire long. I went out to Chicago and stayed with my sister Lucy for a while. And then I started traveling as a musician entertainer. So I, I started moving around a lot. So I, but I know that there were, were problems. I don't know how many blacks from my graduation class stayed right here in Portsmouth. Um, I know my sister Kitty um, ended up leaving, going out to Los Angeles and that sort of thing. A niece of mine went, she became a doctor and she's in um, Raleigh, uh, North Carolina. And, you know, nieces and nephews moved uh, along and moved into other areas. Portsmouth didn't have a lot to offer uh, Blacks uh, back in that time. I don't know how much better it's gotten. I don't see any Black businesses and in Portsmouth, even now, I've always wondered about that. I, um, you know, on the police force, the fire department, the city council, where are these people of color? And it's not because they haven't tried to, to be there. I don't believe that. But uh, um, it's different. this is a difficult era, uh, a difficult area, I mean to say. And it, it always has been. And I think Portsmouth is, is probably not going to change a whole lot when it comes to that. You have to kind of pitch yourself so. into the quilt. You gotta, and, and it's not easy. You gotta be determined and aggressive and of which I'm both. So, <laughs> uh, but, um, and if I had children uh, and I don't, but if I did, I, I can see them probably being a lot like me just saying, no, no, no I'm, I'm coming in here that sort of thing, but that you have to have that determination to make things happen in this area. Well, uh, it, it, it shows the work that needs to be done, certainly. And um, Black Lives Matter Manchester is composing a directory and I think has it online now of black owned businesses in New Hampshire. Uh, and, and I think what you what you point to and what these stories reveal is that the issues then are still with us so long as New Hampshire does perceive itself as a professed white space. And, um, you know, the, to get these stories placed in a way that are reminders that we can't falsify the past of the state, but also, you know, suggest the kind of long-term struggle uh, that, that, that continues today. And I thought maybe, um, Renee, I could ask you, there's been a little, there's been a question or in the two in the chat about um, the park proposal and, and where it's at and, uh, and, and kind of 
related to that, I, I wondered if you might talk a little bit about um, your sense of people's reaction to your books, to the stories that you're bringing forward. And, um, you know, how, how do you see the, it's, it's a very predominantly white community, right? Um, you know, the, the census records somebody put in the chat and uh, that's, you know, that, 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 that has some, some resonance as terms of, you know, how, you know, one can talk a lot about the ways in which New Hampshire has kept itself so white. And I think it has been, you know, actually a proactive effort uh, that one can trace historically. Um, but what, so what's your, what's your sense of, you know, where things are in Exeter right now and uh, the reaction to your books and your park proposal? And... Sure, David. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, the reaction to my books has been wonderful. Um, the reaction to the park project has been wonderful. The select board is all on board. Um, I hope you get a chance to watch our video that we put out the other night. We had um, some great positive questions. What we're trying to do is go kind of slowly on that to make sure that we don't do anything that just won't be right in a few years, you know? Um, so there's really no rush on it. There's also a, um, a slight hiccup with the site because of COVID, the site is blocked off. Um, to traffic. And um, this is Swayze Parkway. Swayze Parkway has been closed off to traffic and, the, and this memorial will be at the very head of Swayze Parkway. Um, it's closed off to traffic and they need to uh, decide whether they want to keep that permanently closed. Um, and if they do not, they have to contact the de Department of Transportation. Anyway, there's a long, a long thing on that. But yeah, generally the reaction has been great. People are um, really willing and ready to do this. Um, we're the ones that are being a little bit slow. There's one other story though that I'd like to share um, in light of what Sharon was saying about hotels. Um, the person that I talk about in my third book, which I happen to have right here, this one is John Garrison Cutler. We just put a plaque up on his building, which still exists downtown Water Street. It's directly right next door to the Water Street bookstore. Um, he grew up in Exeter, um, but his real claim to fame is that he had a hotel at the beach, at Hampton Beach. And this hotel was at Hampton Beach when Hampton Beach was the playground of the rich and famous. He owned this hotel and it, he hosted many politicians, including six sitting U.S. presidents. And he was the owner. Um, currently, that hotel is no longer there. It burned in the 80s, I think. But his restaurant, which was right next door to the hotel, still is there. And many of you have probably eaten there or been there and just didn't know. Because I'm pretty sure they don't have any signage. Um, it is called Ron's Landing today. So this building was built by a very influential Black man who uh, was good friends with many politicians who would come uh, and sit on his porch each summer as they were visiting their friends in the mansions that they owned on Boar's Head. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing. And, and he was actually what, what is kind of known as a kingmaker in the Republican Party um, because of all these politicians summered at his place. So I think it's very interesting to find that there's this hotel owner. Uh, he died in about 1930. And then the things that Sharon are describing at the Wentworth how did we get from here to there in that short period of time? Mm -hmm. Well, another really remarkable story that's certainly worth a lot of investigation. And um, just one little side note, I, I wanted Renee, uh, I've done a little research on this in Exeter, and, uh, but not enough to come up with an answer. But do you know the um, origin of, of uh, Guinea Road in, in Exeter and um, you know, whether there's any thought in town about that name continuing? Um, I do know, I'm not, I don't know the exact origins, but I do know that there was a community of Black people that lived there um, toward, towards the corner, um, the Rollins being one of them. I don't know, I'm thinking for some reason that that is stratum. Maybe I'm wrong. It's right on the Exeter stratum lo a line or maybe it crosses. Um, yeah. So I don't even consider that Exeter, but maybe I should. Uh, we did just have a name, a road changed to it, um, Jubal Martin Road, and Jubal Martin was a farmer, and um, we had to go through it in Exeter to change the roads for 911 reasons, change some of the names, and so the residents of that road decided to rename it to Jubal Martin Road. So that's one of the first roads that have been named 
um, after a black citizen. There were two roads that were uh, renamed, and this was a long, long time ago, Whitfield's Lane, where the poet Whitfield was born. That was originally Whitfield's Lane. It's now Elliott Street. And there was something else called Katie's Lane for Kate Holland, I believe, and that, um, that's been renamed, or maybe even it doesn't exist because there are so many houses jammed in this little section. Mm -hmm. Well, it certainly is important to get these places appropriately noted on the landscape because that is just, just one way the history becomes uh, present. And um, I wondered, uh, Gina, do we have some questions that I haven't seen in the, in the chat that you could bring up? Sure. Um, we have a question. Oh, I see one about the Rockingham Hotel in Portsmouth allowing blacks. And um, I will say just one thing about that, that the Rockingham Hotel was segregated during the 50s, but it desegregated briefly during the filming of Lost Boundaries. Um, De Rochemont, who was one of the great Hollywood directors wanted to make this film about a, a doctor uh, who lived in Keene who had passed for for white because he could not get employment uh, in the north and um, you know how this was uncovered and the difficulties it made and it was a hit film but Hollywood wouldn't film it so he filmed it here in uh, Portsmouth and in in Kittery and used a lot of local folks who were in that that film, and he insisted that the um, Rockingham Hotel, which he was going to rent out a good part of it for the cast and the crew, uh, become desegregated. But then it is it's segregated right back up after after that. And Sharon, I don't know if you remember um, any experiences about when the Rockingham Hotel might have been. Of, I don't of remember uh, the yeah. Rockingham Hotel um, in the fifties. I was uh, a little young. But um, my father was in that movie, uh, Lost Boundaries. And he actually had a small part uh, where he stood up and said, if you're, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, stick around. If you're black, stay back. And that was my father's line that they gave him. I had two sisters also who were in that, that movie. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful wonderful movie it I, yeah. I i remember i remember you know your dad there and that that was a great line it's in the scene um with the with the wife's father down in down in boston right at a supposed yeah. dinner table yeah. dinner party in boston yeah. right about why why they better they better pass right and uh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then the doctor doesn't want to pass so he goes down south to get a job and he's too light complected and they think he's too white so he he, he loses an internship down at a clinic yeah. in the south and uh, yeah so it's, it's yeah. an amazing no matter story. what way he went he it just wasn't working for him yeah, yeah. so complicated times in new hampshire in those in, oh, those, very, days, very. in those days but uh I do recommend that that film. It tells just such a compelling story. And um, and speaking of telling compelling stories, I mentored the uh, film Shadows Fall, Fall North, and um, Lost Boundaries is is featured in there and the filming of it uh, as as well. And so that is one way to to get a little bit of the history of that uh, as well in the context of the larger history of recovering Black history in New Hampshire that Valerie and uh, Jerry and tell uh, it's told so well by uh, Nancy and Brian Vauder in that, yes. that film. Yeah. Um, so Gina, question. Um, we have a question for Renee. Has the American Independence Museum incorporated information about Exeter's Black community? Uh, the Independence Museum is on our committee for the park. Um, uh, I. I approached Emma a couple of years ago telling her about the Jude Hall story, which she knew, um, and she she was fairly new at that time, and she said that was one of the things that she wanted to work on, is to make sure that the Black soldiers' contributions were expanded. Um, she was going to be doing, she and her team were going to be doing research on how they could find out this information. Um, you know, the information is really hard to find historically. It, it either wasn't written down or it's destroyed or, or just, it's just hard to find, but she is on it. And I have faith in Emma, so she's going to get it done. Well, that Jude Law story is just so important for what it indicates um, about that, that generation of 
of free blacks and the, but mostly enslaved African Americans who went into the Revolutionary War to you know fight for white people's freedom basically, but their aspirations that they saw embodied in the Declaration of Independence as as well, and some uh, you know gained their freedom during the war and then not too long afterwards. And that generation, um, they're chronicled in a book by uh, Knobloch called Proud Boys, uh, Brave and Free. But uh, many of them, when they came out of the Revolutionary War, uh, were able to get some capital together. Um, some of them were able to buy some land. And then around them, in many places in New Hampshire, they developed kind of a cluster of African Americans who would gather around these, these folks who um, often were entrepreneurial. They had, they had, they had gotten some land um, and they could support a, a community. And uh, this generation really had a, a large, large impact. Uh, unfortunately, in the early uh, 1800s, New Hampshire, like other places, um, just decided that, that there could not be this phenomenon of successful free black people in the states. So they, they, they renewed disenfranchisement. Uh, they made it very difficult for African American uh, children to get education at public public schools. And um, so it began uh, really a history through the 19th century of this, but the, you know, there's Jude Law and uh, you know, it's, it's true Samson Battis in, in Canterbury over in, uh, in Warner, New Hampshire. Certainly the Prince Whipple story in Portsmouth is pretty well known. You know, his wife starts the African school for African children and he, he is in the African burial society, which is a political and ceremonial group that was prominent in, in Portsmouth. And, um, you know, these, it's, a, it's an important generation and Jude Hall really indicates it just kind of the, the scratching the surface of what that, what that meant and his, his service there. Gina, do we have some, another question? We do, we have um, a couple of sorted, sort of related questions for Sharon. Um, Sharon, this is a sort of a th three part question, three questions I'm combining into one. How did you break into the singing business? When did you return to Portsmouth and start singing in the Portsmouth area? And can you share your story about being asked to perform in blackface for your school program? Well, when did I take an interest in, in, in singing was in high school. Uh, William Elwell, who was the music director there at the time, uh, was quite an influence for me to continue my singing career. He featured me uh, every year for the four years I was in high school um, at the end of a show that was called the Clipper Minstrel Show. Now, the Clipper Minstrel Show, the, uh, the choir that was the backdrop for the entertainers that, that were the features had to perform in front of that backdrop of, of blackface. And I, um, the last year that they used me as, a, they, I was the closer every year and honored to have been so. But the, the, the problem I had was I, I, I could never justify my walking out and performing in front of this, these uh, students in blackface. But I did it for the, my, let's see, freshman, junior, yeah, the three years in high school, freshman, junior year. And in the senior year, I started um, kind of coming into my own and having more of a personality and decided to um, fight for things that I didn't quite agree with. And my personality, I became, I went from this um, introvert to an extrovert, it seemed like overnight. And um, that particular night I went on stage in the orchestra, the orchestra was huge and, and professional. I loved um, the idea that I was being featured with like 30 instrument orchestra. And I went on that night to sing and they, Mr. Elwell walked out on the stage and said, and now ladies and gentlemen, uh, Miss Sharon Jones. And as soon as I heard my name mentioned, something happened to me. And I sat behind the curtain 
and decided I was not going to go out there and perform in front of this black face group of students. And the orchestra was playing the introductions of my song and I was not appearing and they kept playing it. And now the audience is starting to rustle. You hear people in the audience starting to talk and send, and Mr. Elwell kind of stopped the audience, uh, I'm sorry, the orchestra, put his baton down and walked behind the curtain and asked me what was wrong. And I told him. And I remember sitting there, although I was more outspoken, starting to become out into my own, uh, I was still had a, a tint of shyness. And I remember sitting there, you know, afraid to go, but determined not to go. And um, Mr. Elwell said, I understand. And without another word, somehow he got all of those students into the ladies room and boys rooms in the back to wash their faces. And when they reappeared and the curtain reopened, they were all sitting there in white face. And the audience stood up and applauded before I even started singing. It was the most humbling experience. And I just stood there on the stage without singing. I think they played the, um, the introduction more than once before I could gather myself as to what I had just done. And one of the things I think that made, that gave me the decision, made the decision for me was my mother and father were in the audience and they had such pride. My parents were my idols because they, they were smart and informative and dignified. And, and that particular night, I said, I cannot walk out there and justify this any longer. And this is the last time I'm going to do this at the Post High School because it was my senior year. And the audience stood up and applauded. I went into my, my, my song and the applause at the end was astounding. Uh, uh, years later, uh, Mr. Elwell, I'm talking many years later, uh, Mr. Elwell um, came out of a store and I was sitting in front of a restaurant having coffee on a warm afternoon. And he said, how long are you going to be here? And I said, I'm gonna be hanging around a while. I'm, you know, I'm just drinking coffee and, and having a quiet day. He said, I'll be right back. And he came back with a cassette with that whole show on there. And I have it today. And I'm singing, Just the Way You Look Tonight was my last uh, song that I sang at that uh, show that night. And I think about that often because the Portsmouth High School changed the show to the Clippers show that year. And it was never ever called the Portsmouth uh, Minstrel Show again. So I felt, I felt that I made a little bit of history. And I, I kept going with my singing career from that point on, because I, I really enjoyed it. That was, you know, I think entertainers uh, use their platform um, for, for what it was intended, but you also uh, find a way to throw little digs in during your show. You get a chance to use that platform to get other messages out there. And I started doing that. I went to Los Angeles. I traveled all over the United States, um, ended up in Los Angeles. And um, I came back to Portsmouth because my brother was also leading a band and they lost their, um, their vocalist. And he asked me if I would come back and take her place. So I ended back in Portsmouth. And, and, but from that point on, I, I've been doing well here as an entertainer. So that's that whole story. Oh my, what a what a wealth of stories! And uh, you know, it's not that long ago, is it? Fifty no, years. No, and, not uh, at all. You know, I, you know, blackface minstrelsy had such a strong presence in the north, and um, yeah. you know, they, they were performed. The shows were performed into the nineteen well into the nineteen sixties in Newmarket, 
and other towns in New Hampshire, often sponsored by the fire department or police department or some other group, ladies club, as a uh, fundraiser. And um, that that continued. And, you know, just let me throw in a little, uh, little piece of history about blackface in New Hampshire. The blackface images uh, were promulgated before there were movies through stereo view cards. And maybe you've seen these, it's the card with the two images and you put the little viewer on and it looks like it's 3D. Right. Yeah. Okay. And um, Kilburn and Kilburn Company up in Littleton, New Hampshire, starting in the 1870s and for decades after was the largest producer of stereo view cards in the world. And they specialized in blackface. Uh, cards. They had a special line of that, as well as, you know, they will go down in the, in the, in the wintertime down to Florida and elsewhere and take pictures of plantation life. And they would stage these and they would stage some blackface and African Americans and demeaning roles uh, in these cards up in Littleton wow. as well. And, um, you know, this before Birth of a Nation, the film was released and this, this was the vehicle produced here in New Hampshire for getting those images out um, of these these racist tropes, um, you know, throughout, not, and they marketed around the world. So uh, it's just how powerful these images are, and how long that they uh, they 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 persisted. And you know, Spike Lee's "Bamboozled" is perhaps the best and That's you right. know most painful history of of uh, of blackface. And um, you know, it's just. Uh, it's the, 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 these stories are so compelling and you know what that what that meant for you to be able to stand up in front of that auditorium. Well, to, to interrupt you for I did what was interesting is during the three years that, that I performed in front of the blackface, I didn't have enough knowledge at that age and I didn't look at what it represented. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I found out what it represented is when I refused to go back out there, I might have refused to have done that earlier if I had taken the time to learn about the significance, what 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 those images meant, but I didn't. And I and my and another interesting thing is that my my younger sister Kitty was part of that backdrop of the blackface. And she said, when I refused to go out there that night, she just uh, fell apart, you know? And, and I didn't even know that until a couple of years ago. She says, you know, I was, I was sitting there just, just crying my eyes out when you made that decision to uh, walk out there. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I wondered if, if Pauline wouldn't mind. Uh, Pauline, if you can unmute yourself. And uh, okay. thank you, Pauline, so much. And you know, because we don't have Barbara uh, with with us, um, do, do you have any sense of how it was for her and her children uh, in in Nashua in these these years about you know what what experience they might have had of these kinds of attitudes towards black people? And well, it was difficult because you know the the prejudice was there. Uh, and 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 I think so. For so many people in in Nashville, we just never even were exposed to black people. There was a handful of them in town, and and when they lived with us, I can remember our kids changed school. They went from parochial school to public school, and one and so my they didn't know the kids when they went to the to the new school. And one of the children said to my daughter, "Oh, I know who you are." Oh, I, you, you know, you might not know me, but I know who you are. You're the family that has the black people living with you. It was like, it was a big deal. You know, it was just so strange. And, uh, and we got involved in, in the, uh, the whole black movement uh, through, through Tom Keenan and through the, the U university universalist church, because they had, a, they had a group of people there that met. And and uh, we had a we had a, a man. Uh, his name was um, um, what was uh, the the, the uh, engineer from Sanders, honey, uh, Don Land, who was a, a six foot four 
black man who worked at Sanders and who also organized, he was, he was a black man. He organized, that was mostly white people because that's what there was and, and the few blacks that were available into doing different things. And he had talked in front of town hall. He, we had a rally in front of the town hall one time. And uh, and the mayor, I can't remember who the mayor was at the time, you know, said, well, you know, that black idiot should go home where he comes from or something like that. And then we were going to have another demonstration and they wouldn't give us permission for it. So they somebody had written in the paper, well, they ought to go to the, the dump. So we went to the dump and had a demonstration <laughs> at the dump. <laughs> and so we had pins, the pins that said, uh, dump the war this was the, this was also the war the anti-war movement kind of got mixed in with everything at some point <laughs> the vietnam against the vietnam war yeah so it was interesting times interesting times and i used to keep we had some black a black uh, a movement marches in Nashua and I kept I used to keep my kids out of grammar school to come march with me so <laughs> Yeah, so right. we, thank you. Thank you so much. Time. Okay, thank you. And Renee, I see a, I see a question um, for you in the in the chat too, if you could unmute. Um, just about, you know, what got you interested in doing research on the black community in, in Exeter? And, and, you know, kind of the question too is, how do you think it's changed you to, to come into this knowledge? Sure. Um, I saw that go by, so I, I typed a little thing in there, but um, I took a class with Richard Haynes, the artist, mm -hmm. um, yeah. like a storyteller that uses positive visioning. And I like to use positive visioning. Uh, as you know, I do some environmental work and I was transition town and they are positive visioning. So I use that as well as what I learned from Richard. That was a very valuable class. That was like an eight week class, half discussion and half art. Um, and it was held here uh, through a grant of the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, I believe it was held in Exeter in the Baptist Church. Um, so th there was that part. And then also there was a book that I read uh, just a few years ago called Lies My Teacher Told Me. And that book has had a huge effect on me. Um, I guess I just don't like to feel duped. And when I read that book, I was like, you know, what? So it, it was, you know, kind of news to me being uh, up, up here. I'm, I'm originally from Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, so Gloucester and then New Hampshire. Um, so those two things, I think, were well, what started it for me. And then I became a fan of Barbara over at the Exeter Historical Society. She puts out these great um, video minutes and all kinds of articles that she puts in the newspaper. And how it's affected me personally, um, it's hard to say, you know, I, I often think to myself, well, why am I the one doing this? <laughs> who, who am I to do this or whatever? But then um, I just do it. I don't know. I just do it. I, uh, it seems like there's a lot of primary information out there that hasn't really been put out into the more mainstream public. And I find that maybe I have some talents or some skills that can help take it to the next level. And then after that, I'm hoping that some professionals will come in and do awesome things to it, like Hollywood and you know who knows whatever else. Um, so that's that's my thought. I'm just raising it to the next level, and then somebody else take it away. Well, you raise an awfully interesting question, Renee, and I, it's one that has a lot of resonance for for me and for others. You know, as as a as a white person coming to this work now, you know, my family is interracial, and so our son certainly experienced life in New Hampshire as a as a black person growing up but you know I, I don't claim anything from that and I, I really I really have I mean it is really ever since I've been doing this teaching and work starting in the 1970s or 80s um, I do I think it's very important to be aware of the white privilege as we call it now um, but also the kind of sense of appropriation that can come with being the voice for this, these stories. And, um, you know, and I, I think it's something really to be to be considered. And, um, you know, in some ways, I think it is so true, as you say, that the research is there to be done. And it's good to be to do the research. But I do also wonder whether or not when I when I try to move into the interpretive or the explanatory phase of that, 
whether I really, really understand at a certain way. Um, I think the opportunity for the in the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire or, you know, the Seacoast chapter of NAACP or, you know, I mean, where, wherever, wherever one involves one self is the opportunity for that kind of partnership to to occur that um, that 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 issue and because it has been you know the white appropriation control of history for so long and for, of the media that that issue can be front and center you know and and that's i think what the black heritage trail has tried to do so much with the the tea talk talk series and really of all of its programs is to to get into some of those hard conversations of who who is telling what story and and what does that mean to be telling that that story yeah, exactly. So that's why, you know, when I wrote these three books, I wanted to talk about these stories, but I didn't want to be those characters, you know, as the writer. I didn't I didn't have the I just didn't know enough about their experiences. So what I did, the device that I used was I also researched some women from that area. So Tabitha Tenney is the person I kind of use more in my first book. And she was um uh, the very one of the very first American novelists. She wrote a best-selling. What a what a hoot! Her book is just a hoot, isn't it? <laughs> it was hilarious. It was it was good to be able to use her. So in that yeah. book, you know, I I use her voice a lot. Um, yeah. And in the second book, I use a woman called Betsy Clifford. She was the daughter of Ebenezer Clifford, and she was a spinster. So she inherited everything, and then she lived for a number of years. So she just did what she wanted, and she had money, and she was older, and that's you know. Sometimes women do that. Um, she she was in the abolitionist era, and she brought um, an abolitionist speaker to her garden, uh, had a garden party when he was not allowed to speak in town. Um, we're not quite sure what speaker she had, but I do know that at a certain time in Exeter, there was an abolitionist speaker, Stephen Foster, who was dragged out physically from the Congregational Church one Sunday. Um, he did a uh, a direct action, uh, nonviolence. He laid himself right down in the aisle on Sunday and wouldn't move and just kept saying his thing until they dragged him down every stair. If you've ever been in the congregation, all right, so all those stairs, they had to drag him down. So, um, so she took him on, you know, she did it. And then in the third one, it was in the suffragette era. And so I was just so happy to find who uh, Exeter's suffragettes were. And so those are the voices that I use because I, I think I would have been a suffragette. <laughs> well, I think that's you're pointing to a, a what's for you has been an important an important strategy uh, there. Um, we've had in the, a, the, in the chat uh, some questions directed to me about a bill that is currently in the New Hampshire House with, which would prevent um, training or, or uh, instruction about um, you know uh, racial awareness, equity, and so on. Uh, in by by any state employee or government office, and um, you know, I, I the, the ACLU just says this is patently going to be unconstitutional if it if it should pass. But it is a it is an indicator of what's at stake and the responsibility I think that the New Hampshire state legislature has uh, towards having created you know, in New Hampshire's history since it became a state, uh, a place where such ideas can be entertained in some, some cases enforced. In my research on the Concord Black Heritage Tour, which was just released this week by the Black Heritage Tour of, of New Hampshire, um, discovered that the very first meeting of the New Hampshire legislature in 1782 at Reverend Walker's house, the uh, governor's council, the house and the Senate were served by his three enslaved uh, people, Violet, Prince, and Luce. And so from the very beginning, the implication is, is there. Uh, we have to fight these bills. We have to call them out. Um, it is difficult being in the minority now in, in the New Hampshire legislature. Uh, and it's not just here, it's the voter suppression bills. And I don't wanna, didn't wanna turn this into a political <laughs> soapbox, but um, it's good that people are aware of these things and uh, and and just what our elected officials are are entertaining these days up there in Concord. So Gina, um, I think we have time for maybe one or two more. If you could select uh, something there. Sally, Sally Hirschberg has her hand up. Sally, if you want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question. 
Well, I think you answered my question, David. It, my question was about the um, legislation and that it obviously includes teachers, yes? Yes. I, I would be very surprised if it survives the House and gets over to the Senate. I, 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 I can't face it for sure, but I have some confidence the Senate would not pass this. But the ACLU has weighed in on it that it would be entirely unconstitutional if it had to go to court. But, um, but, that, but, such, but that such a thing is filed it's and has co-sponsors and has a hearing speaks volumes about yes. you know, the atmosphere in this, this country. And, and I, again, I think back to history, you know, Franklin Pierce, who was our one president, um, got, you know, prevented John Parker Hale because he was an abolitionist from getting reelected to the Senate back in the 1850s. Um, when abolitionists wanted to speak in Concord, he led a, a gang that stormed the townhouse. Sound familiar? To prevent people from discussing uh, ab abolition. And, uh, you know, Frederick Douglass was uh, up here as close friends with Abby Kelly Foster and Stephen Foster, traveled to New Hampshire multiple times. You can read some of his rather ironic reportings of his um, reception in New Hampshire and his the second and third versions of his his autobiography. Um, but, you know, when Douglas said in that speech that he wished that the politicians of today when Washington would get a backbone again and not stand there and defend the stripping away of voting rights from black people, but actually return to defending the constitution. It, it, it was spoken in 1892, but obviously could have been spoken uh, January 6, 2000, 2021. So I hope that our, our hope, our history, and, and you know the stories that we're hearing today can can be a, a, a sense of awareness, but also a sense of empowerment. You know that this is they, the, the, the people in the past knew it was a, a, at stake, and they they took undertook these battles, and uh, now the torch has been passed to this generation. And it is why I think what Sharon was saying about the optimism about Black Lives Matters, about the young people, the Dream Project Dream in Dover, that. Um, you know, there's a rising generation, and uh, there is much to much to be done. So, Gina, after that little speech, <laughs> have another question. Um, I, have, I have I have two. Um, first, Ivy um, Valdis, you had your hand up. Do you still have a question, Ivy? If you could unmute yourself, there you go. Okay, I just unmuted myself. I I had put my hand up and then took it, took it back down. Um, but when my mother, my mother is Pauline. Um, when my mother was talking about um, when I was in, when we had moved from the um, parochial school to the grammar school. Um, and one of, I had a classmate that said to me, and I'm kind of embarrassed to even say it because it's not a term I ever use, um, but somebody said to me, oh, I hear, hear you have a family of jigaboos living with you. And I had never heard the word before. Um, it was not a word that we ever used at home. And I assumed that this person meant that that was their last name. And I said, oh, no, their last name is Thompson, <laughs> which their name at the time. And kind of walked, you know, and I said something about, yeah, they've been just living with us for a while or something. But it was just, I had mm. totally no idea <laughs> what. And it was several years later when I realized what she had said and what she meant. So I was just going to share that. Well, as a lifelong educator, it, you know, is always a difficult reminder that white people learn how to be white in our schools. Yeah. 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 It's hard. Gina, another one more question? Yes. Um, Sharon. This question has been asked a couple of times. Um, how did you determine which places were safe for you to go? And also, how did you calculate whether you'd go there anyway, in spite of the risks? Well, I, I don't think um, I, I ever did uh, go there anyway during that certain period, because there a lot of fights would break out and that sort of thing. And I didn't want to be part of that physical uh, thing that was going on. But um, there were a few black families in Portsmouth. I, I think there were originally maybe 
five or six original black families in Portsmouth. And we, um, we um, if you will, hung together. You know, there were the Ramseys uh, and, and the Cantaves the and the Mayos and the Joneses and the Satchels. And so there were a, a few. And we hung together as a, as a family, more than friends, as a family. And um, back in that time, there weren't as many clubs and restaurants anyway that you, when you went to a restaurant, you went there to eat. Now the clubs and the lounges are all part of the restaurant and the entertainment. So you go there for various different reasons. But um, we didn't delve into those dangerous uh, areas so much back then. The movement um, during the late 50s and early 60s for us had just begun. And our parents were fighting that fight. So we weren't quite in that loop. What I was trying to get at with that question was, was more how you internally looked at the world and, and you and your family and friends internally uh, faced that world, which was uh, so unwelcoming. And yet you sort of have to participate in some of it, going to school, going to the store, um, if you want to go out to eat, all of those things. So, sort of, can you make us feel like we're in your shoes facing that unfriendly environment? Well, you know, that that environment, believe it or not, sometimes I, I experience that same feeling even today. Um, I, I, uh, a lot of my friends are white, of course, because this is where I'm, where I am. And the ones who are my friends are really my friends, along with the black friends that I have. And we have many discussions. And I, I told them, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, before the pandemic, I used to like to stop at uh, some of the restaurants or lounge after I worked at a law firm at the time. Um, and I would go to a lounge maybe on a Thursday night, have a cocktail, listen to the music. And, you know, there, there's um, that feeling that you still have to behave differently. You still have to address things differently. You, you, um, you dress the part differently. Um, to, to, to give you an example, I was sitting in a lounge, local lounge, about a year ago, and a table of patrons got very uh, vocal and boisterous. And there's something that happens to me when I experience that. It's almost as if I'm waiting for something to happen that I'm going to have to run from. Either somebody's going to blurt out the N word or something. It, you're always uh, in that space where you're waiting for it to happen. And so, uh, uh, in answer to your question, I think um, we're always um, braced for um, something to happen that's going to pull us into it, even though we didn't want to be. Um, in Portsmouth, when you walk into a restaurant, uh, even today, of course, most of the time, you're going to be the only one in there that, that is of color. If, if, if maybe two or three more, more people of color are in there. But you're never in a real situation where, where there's a lot of us. And I feel that that, um, that privilege that somebody brought up a little earlier they, it, there's, it, it's such a privilege that it's, it's, they, they even embark upon that privilege if it makes the person next to them uncomfortable to go out and have dinner quietly and for this table to be next to you where they're at the top of their vocal point and drinking and talking loud and saying whatever they want to say. And I was always taught and my whole family, I think a lot of black uh, people or kids have thought this, you know, that there's a certain behavior when you're out in public. 
and 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 I've always lived by that. I've never ever raised my voice beyond a certain level out in public, especially in a restaurant. I'm always aware of what my behavior is, who's around me. And it's gone back to that with this climate that we have out there mm -hmm. now with uh, past president and all of these things going on. We're back to that same point. But I feel that I'm, I'm a step ahead of them because <laughs> I've always had to do that. So I'm, I'm well seasoned and it's unfortunate because I don't feel that I should have to, to be aware 100% all of the time, that I don't really let my hair down. And even if I did, that wouldn't be at the same degree of which I've seen other, these others let their hair down. But you're always aware. And mm -hmm. I, I find that um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I've had the opportunities to travel in other areas because when I perform in like Boston or New York, that you don't feel that out there. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember when I was working in the Catskill Mountains, believe it or not, you you felt it up there. It was on, yeah. it was, uh, and then they had comedians and people who would go on stage and tell black jokes and it just never went away. Mm -hmm. Until this day, you still feel that degradation that settles in there. When am I going to be free to be able to do this or do that? Yeah. It doesn't happen. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon, for raising your voice nice and loud with us today. And I want to also thank uh, Renee again for just a wonderful presentation and okay. in absentia. Thanks, Barbara and Pauline, so much appreciate your coming in and sharing some more stories uh, about Barbara and about your experiences as well. Um, so now uh, I'm going to turn it over to Angela Matthews, a uh, board member of the Black Heritage Trail of New Hampshire, who's going to help us close out. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Thank Angela. you. Yes, thank you. Let me add my thanks. And a couple of quick reminders. The um, program today is brought to us by New Hampshire Humanities, who are a sponsor for this, for the Tea Talk series. And uh, Thomas Hooker is also, we're in his debt of gratitude for him bringing us this program by sponsoring the program in honor of his wife, the late Eleanor Williams Hooker. Uh, and just want to add my voice to the appreciation that's already been expressed. Thank you, Renee, for the work that you were doing in Exeter and for capturing a truer history of New Hampshire in your books. As a tour guide for the trail, it's stunning to me how the truer history is making such a difference. Guests always end our tour curious why they did not know these stories and the need for teaching them, teaching them in our schools as well as in uh, novels and history books. I was also just so stunned and moved to hear Barbara's story today. While I have heard of reverse freedom riders like the guests on my tour, I didn't know as much as I should have known. And I found that story the head, behind the headlines so deeply moving. So thank you, Barbara and Pauline, for sharing something from a very challenging time. The challenging times seem never to want to go away. And when I consider the circumstances of the past four years, I'm reminded that, as David said earlier, these issues are always with us. And if New Hampshire sees itself as a white place, it makes it understandable that we continue to deal with the same concerns. So continue to come to these programs and learn how we together can make a difference. We seem to have the same, share the same heart and mind perhaps on this. And Sharon, you so aptly put it, you have to make a difference. You have to have determination to make a difference in New Hampshire. And I came to Portsmouth in the early seventies and I saw you perform on a Sunday morning in Prescott Park and just was wowed by the community that I'd come to. I remember, I remember it vividly to this day. And I also remember you hearing you tell your story at True Tales Live about the minstrel show at Portsmouth High School. It moved me today as much as it moved me then. And I, uh, I so admire you for the courage that you had as a teenager in high school to step into that role and say, this is not right and it has to stop. 
So um, thank you so much for what you did for all of us in this community in that moment in time. And all of you, there were 280 of us at one time during this program. Thank you all for joining us. Come again next week and you'll hear a whole set of wonderful news stories about the power of place, Martha's Vineyard and the growth of the black elite. Um, it take, it's set in um, Oak, Oaks Bluffs and where uh, freed slaves and laborers and sailors of the 18th, 18th century settled. And then in the 1930s and 40s became home to urban uh, urbanites who wanted a wonderful summer vacation, a place to vacation. So look forward to seeing you next week and we won't disappoint. It's going to be another stellar program. Thanks all for coming today. And thanks again, Sharon and Barbara and Renee and David for sharing your stories with us today it was just greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. And I think this is the point at which we can all leave the program and join again next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>